the controversy over teach the controversy. On April 11, uh, the state of Tennessee passed a law allowing public school teachers to, quote, help students understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the scientific strengths and scientific weaknesses of existing scientific theories. The journal Nature was very upset about this idea. Now, and if you're interested in, that follows a similar law in Louisiana in 2008. And uh, there, the references for those who are looking at the video can stop them and write them down. The uh, <coughs> Tennessee Monkey tr Bill becomes law. This is Nature News. And interestingly, although most of nature is behind a paywall, this is not. You can get this on the internet. Tennessee monkey bill becomes law. A second US state lets schools teach the controversy surrounding politically charged topics in science. The governor of Tennessee has allowed the passage of the monkey bill giving public school teachers license to teach alternatives to those mainstream scientific theories often attacked by religious and political conservatives. Nicknamed after the monkey trial of 1925 in which Tennessee prosecuted high school science teacher John Scopes for violating a state law against teaching evolution, the new measure allows public school teachers to help students understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the scientific strengths and, weaknesses and scientific weaknesses of existing scientific theories. Sounds very reasonable. Biologic evolution, global warming, the chemical origin of life, and human cloning are listed as examples of such theories. Now, if you'll notice over on the right-hand side, they have a picture of 1925 trying to evoke, this, this, this is a second scopes law. The legislation which was passed in both houses of the Republican-controlled state legislature with strong margins was sent to Governor William Haslam, also Republican, on 29 March. He neither signed nor vetoed the bill, so it automatically became law on 10 April. This is one of the things, uh, as a governor in Tennessee, apparently you don't have to actually sign the bill. Uh, all you have to do is just leave it alone and it becomes law. And the, apparently the reason he left it alone is because as he put it, I do not believe that this legislation changes the scientific standards that are taught in our schools or the curriculum that is used by our teachers. In other words, there's no point to the law, Hasm said in a written statement explaining his equivocal stance. However, I also don't believe that it accomplishes any, anything that isn't already acceptable in our schools. This is why, but on the other hand, it's not bad law. It's just, it's just codifying something that's already supposed to be there. Proponents of the law maintain that its purpose is simply to encourage skepticism and evidence-based reasoning. Critical thinking fosters good science, said uh, Robin Zimmer. Interestingly, they picked uh, the person from the uh, affiliates of the Center for Faith and Science, which is a creationist institution in Knoxville. Um, but opponents say that the real goal of the bill is apparent from the list of subjects it singles out. HB 368 and other bills like it are a permission slip for teachers to bring creationism, climate, control deni uh, climate change denial, and other non-science into science classrooms. Uh, we'll come back into that in a little bit. Uh, says Eugenie Scott, director of the National Center for Science Education. The National Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Association of Biology Teachers have also denounced the measure. Now remember, this is being written in Nature, so of course, if the National Center for Science Education and the National Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Association of Biology Teachers have approved of this, this must be wonderful, uh, a, a wonderful position, and therefore the law must be a bad law as have 4,400 Tennessee residents. Wait, how many residents are there in Tennessee? Okay, 
uh, many of them scientists, who on 5 April, how's that for vague? 4,400 Tennessee residents, many of them scientists, who uh, signed a petition asking Haslam to veto the bill. What's missing here? Are there any petitions for Haslam to sign the bill, and how many people did they have? Um, this is what you call one-sided reporting. Uh, you know, aside from the fact that Helen Thomas may have her own personal bias, uh, if I read this, I'm going, not only do you have a personal bias, but you let your bias get into the, your news reporting. Um, it would be helpful to say, well, there wasn't one for the bill, or something like that. Although I doubt that that's what the case is. The bill's critics see it as classic academic, as a classic, quote, academic freedom, end quote, measure aimed at giving teachers license to teach evolution as a matter of scientific controversy. Hmm. In recent years, the Discovery Institute, an intelligent design advocacy group based in Seattle, Washington, has championed this approach as a strategic way around a prohibition on promoting religion in, in U.S. public schools. Um, uh, maybe it's the way it should have been done the first time. That barrier, based on separation of church and state in the U.S. Constitution, has thwarted previous efforts to mandate the teaching of creation-like alternatives alongside evolution. What is creationism-like alternatives? Um, is this a subtle acknowledgement that, that uh, intelligent design really isn't creationism in its traditional sense? But it has not yet been tested against an academic freedom law. Um, this is untried territory. Well, we'll get down into that as well. The Tennessee measure is only the second such law to be passed in the United States. Louisiana enacted the first in 2008. Oh, somebody else has tried it before. Wonder what their results were. Um, but 10 states have considered them in the past two years, so this is something that might be growing. It is hard to predict the new law's real-world effects. Curriculum decisions are made uh, district by district and classroom by classroom. Well, I wonder where it was tried before, what were its results? Points out Josh Rosenau, Director of Programs and Policy at the NSCSE. According to Barbara Forrest, a philosopher at Southwestern Louisiana University, in Louisiana, of course, and co-founder of the Louisiana Coalition for Science, the 2008 Louisiana law, quote, has produced unintended charges in the state board, uh, changes, excuse me, in the state boards of education's implementation policy, which now doesn't prohibit discussion of creationism or intelligent design and allows local school boards to select textbooks outside of those approved by the state. Hmm. So they can actually bring in uh, outside material. I think that was the intention of the law. I don't think that was unintended consequences at all. But in Tennessee, unlike in Louisiana, the law requires teachers to stay within the state science curriculum. So the ramifications of the law will depend on how local teachers and school boards interpret that requirement. Um, there are school districts in Tennessee that don't pay any attention to the state curriculum, says Timothy Gaudin a biologist at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. So there are some people who are going to do what they want no matter what, which means that this law wouldn't have changed anything they were going to do anyway, I guess. Gaudin says that the law could cost Tennessee dearly if parents sue, which they might have grounds to do. Gaudin is saying that, that this is a dangerous law and it might cost money because of suits. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1987 that the mandated teaching of creationism alongside the theory of evolution in public classrooms was unconstitutional. And um, I've highlighted this little statement. 
So far, no one has challenged Louisiana's law in court. That's, what, four years now? Plenty of time to make the challenges. Why no challenges? Could be because the law is uh, actually a good one or a, um, a constitutional one because um, all of the other ones have faced challenges. Um, Arkansas, Louisiana won, um, uh, Dover School Board, they've all, gotten, they've all had challenges. But this one didn't. Well, that reason, said Rosenau, my guess is that the greatest practical effects will actually be on climate change and human cloning fronts rather than evolution because there's no constitutional issue on, these, on those subjects. Um, well, maybe, maybe. Whatever happens, says Scott, Tennessee's law will be closely watched, just as the Tennessee bill was in, inspired by a similar law in Louisiana. She says the Tennessee bill will surely inspire other states to go down this same, in her opinion, dangerous path. Although for Louisiana, it doesn't seem to be too dangerous. It seems to be working just fine. Now, the text of the Louisiana law itself, just in case you're, you know, you've read this, all these horrible things about what, what the law might do, it's relatively straightforward. The, there's first a section on purposes, and you know, and among other things, it talks about uh, students' critical thinking skills and open discussion of scientific theories and support and guidance for teachers and so forth. So they enacted this law. And um, the law actually begins at 285.1. Science education, development of critical thinking skills. This section, first they say what the, uh, the legal name of the bill is, uh, Louisiana Science Education Act. The State Board of Elementary and, uh, and Secondary Education, upon request of a city, parish, or other local public school board, shall allow and assist teachers, principals, and other school administrators to create and foster an environment within public elementary and secondary schools that promotes critical thinking skills logical analysis, and open and objective discussion of scientific theories being studied, including but not limited to evolution, the origins of life, global warming, and human cloning. Interesting. Such assistance shall include support and guidance for teachers regarding effective ways to help students understand, analyze, critique, and objectively review scientific theories being studied, including those enumerated in paragraph one of this subsection. A teacher shall teach the material presented in the standard textbooks supplied by the school system, and thereafter may use supplemental textbooks and other instructional materials to help the students understand, analyze, critique, and review scientific theories in a, an objective manner as permitted by the city, parish, or other local public school board. And then this last little bit was added at the end, uh, un unless otherwise prohibited by the State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. So the idea is that the, the board will have a little bit of control over what's going on in the, in the schools, but uh, unless it says something specific, uh, school teachers have uh, latitude as long as they're being fair. Uh, this section shall not be construed to promote any religious doctrine, promote discrimination for or against a particular set of religious beliefs, or promote discrimination for or against religion or non-religion. That's, of course, put in there as an ironclad boilerplate that says you can't teach religion in, in class. Uh, and that probably means that you can't teach creationism, um, although you might be able to teach something about age of the earth, I suppose, as long as you kept it to scientific stuff. 
the um, State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education in each city parish or the local public school board shall adopt and promulgate the rules and regulations necessary to implementing provision of the second section prior to the beginning of the 2008-2009 school year. So, in other words, it needs to be started right after the bill is passed. And then the final section says that it becomes effective immediately upon the governor's signature or upon the expiration or upon uh, the day after it's passed over the governor's veto, which is basically restating the Constitution except that what it's, what it's trying to say is there's a date by which the law starts and it's fixed in that section. So that's, the, that's Louisiana law and that's the one that has not been challenged in four years now. Tennessee law is a bunch of um, uh, scientific subjects in elementary school and this is um, what the uh, um, uh, the code starts with the General Assembly finds that an important purpose of science education is to inform students about scientific evidence and to help students develop critical thinking skills necessary to become intelligent, productive, and scientifically informed citizens. The teaching of some scientific subjects, including but not limited to biological evolution, the chemical origins of life, global warming, and human cloning can cause controversy. Yeah, I would say. And uh, some teachers may be unsure of the expectations concerning how they should present information on sub subjects. So that's why this law is really there, is to give the poor public school person who's teaching some kind of backup if they decide to do this in a teach the controversy manner. The State Board of Education, public elementary and secondary school governing authorities, hmm. I took that straight out of the um, text. I wouldn't think they had make that mistake. Directors of schools, school system administrators, and public elementary and secondary school principals and administrators shall endeavor to create an environment within public elementary and secondary schools that encourages students to explore scientific questions, learn about scientific evidence, develop critical thinking skills, and respond appropriately and respectfully to differences of opinion about co controversial issues. By the way, I think that critical thinking skills is now a new buzzword in education. Am I right or not? No. Critical thinking, no. Um, but it's a, it, is a, it is something that teachers like to say that they are trying to inculcate into students. Um, maybe it's not a new buzzword, but it's a buzzword. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, and so here's all this list of people that are supposed to do this. Endeavor to assist teachers to find effective ways to pre present the science curriculum as it addresses scientific controversies. And of course in the bill it lists four of them that are, that are specifically designated as controversies. Um, neither the State Board of Education nor any public elementary or secondary, anyway, this is standard boilerplate uh, legalese that's basically na naming all the people that might get in the way and the, saying they can't do it, shall prohibit any teacher in a public school system of this state from helping students understand, analyze, critique, and review in an objective manner the scientific strengths and scientific weaknesses of existing scientific theories covered in the courses, course being taught. Now, this section only protects the teaching of scientific information and shall not be construed to promote any religious or non-religious doctrine, promote discrimination for or against a particular set of religious beliefs or non-beliefs, or promote discrimination for or against religion or non-religion. Now, this is stuck in there specifically to make it difficult to challenge this on First Amendment grounds. And then 
it says that you have to notify everybody of the provisions of this act if you're the, the Department of Education. And um, this act shall take effect upon becoming a law and the, the public welfare requiring it. Now this time they're not nearly as specific, I presume, because the Tennessee uh, Constitution is very specific about, you know, if you don't sign the law, then it becomes law or, or so forth. Um, that the governor won't sign the law. Now, of course, the, um, the reaction to this we've already read, and uh, this is an interesting uh, quote from Eugenie Scott. It is already clear that the new slogan for the ID movement is going to be, teach the controversy. Even though there is no scientific controversy over the validity of evolution in biology, Whoa, um, okay, so intelligent design doesn't count. Um, by the way, this is pretty consistent from her. There is no controversy. What do you mean teach the controversy? And of course, now the law says there is one, so. What, the question that I have is what does Eugenie Scott do with evidence such as the recent meeting of what had been dubbed the Altenberg 16 is a whole book. Of, uh, it's, by the way, a, um, it looks like she just dumped her files is what it looks like. Uh, there's been very little attempt to, uh, you'll, you'll run into a paragraph and then later on discussing the same person you'll run into that exact same paragraph. Um, it's a little disconcerting to read th that. Um, but, but the one thing that's nice is she did just dump her files so that uh, when she has interviews, they're just the way she got them. And that's kind of nice. Now, if Susan Mazur is right, there are apparently a number of highly qualified scientists who believe that the mechanism of random mutations and natural selection are inadequate to explain biologic history and are looking for new mechanisms. The one that's most commonly touted is self-organization or self-assembly if you're talking about uh, non-living things. Um, a little introduction, uh, Susan Mazur is a journalist who got into the science beat from what I can tell, number one, she's secular. She is not a religious person at all. She got onto Eugenie Scott's case for having a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on their board. What are you doing letting religious people be in the National Center for Science Education? Of course, the real reason, which nobody can say, is a political one. They wanted a Mormon on their board so that they could say that, see, evolution isn't harmful to Mormons. And uh, in fact, that's, that's what the whole point is, that evolution is not harmful to religion. Well, except for certain religions and they're kind of the, um, they're not believable religions anyway. Which is an easy way of dismissing fundamentalist Protestantism and uh, uh, dismissing Adventism at the same time. So uh, she really is against the religion, just depends on which religion it is. Um, Susan Mazur is strongly anti-war. If you read through here, you'll find that she criticizes people who uh, do defense contracting work, make secret weapons. Um, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm sympathetic to that point of view. Uh, she sees Darwinian competition as a bad model to follow, both in business where, you know, ruthless tooth and claw competition shouldn't exist, and also between nations, which is, of course, you know, part of her anti-war stance. So she sees that this, you know, this idea of survival of the fittest, you know, puts you kind of in the well, she didn't say it in that many words, but it puts you into the category of Nazi Germany, you know. Um, 
the Aryans are good, the other people are bad, this is a struggle for existence, and the Aryans are going to come up on top because they're the better race. And besides that, even if they weren't, they needed to struggle because whoever is the better race needs to come, up, come out on top because that's the way life is. It's fight. The compassion for the weak, that's sissy stuff. Um, she would be quite happy if Darwinism were not the driving force for how we got here. In other words, people will appeal to, but you know, we evolved by Darwinian evolution. What's so wrong with Darwinian evolution? If you could say somehow that, that natural selection really doesn't have any place in how we got here, then you could say, you could say, so we have no business acting like Darwinian selection should influence our thought processes. So what I'm saying is Susan Mazur is not a, an unbiased observer. Now, having said that, I don't think bias is all that bad. Um, I think that in, in some cases, bias can help one persevere against social pressure. And I think that's what she's doing, that there's a lot of pressure to accept Darwinism and uh, evolution and um, And there are those who immediately turn her off if she says something, and there are those who turn off her uh, favorite researchers if they say something. I think she is convincing evidence that a number of secular scientists do not believe random variations and natural selection are the whole s story. And more important to the point I'm making, they're secular scientists. What that means is that this idea that there is no conflict over Darwinism is poppycock. Now, it may be that there's a majority and a minority side. It may be that the majority side it will turn out eventually to be right. But what you can't say is that the minority doesn't exist and that this isn't a controversial subject. Well. Uh, just just for fun, this is this is one of the little sidelights, and this will feed into what we'll talk about later. Here's a, a a little snippet of her interview with David Koch, and if the name Koch rings a bell with you, yes, that's the David Koch. This is one of the Koch brothers, the ones that uh, are uh, infamous or famous, depending on whose side you're on, um, uh, as being uh, conservative money bags and uh, uh, putting their money where their mouth is and uh, some people in, reli in, um, not in, in um, Wisconsin have had, uh, uh, have complained that they're funding the uh, re-election of, uh, of Scott Walker and so forth. Yeah, that's, these are the Cokes. Um, but Coke is apparently, um, interested in funding other things as well, uh, including evolutionary research. And uh, just, uh, just a snippet of their conversation. Uh, Koch, that's interesting. It's hard to believe the Catholics, uh, Catholic professionals would support the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. And Mazur says, there's a big shakeup going on, which is what I've been reporting. And then Koch continues, <coughs> after all, Galileo was in prison for years for saying the world was round. Evolution's a bleep of a lot more extreme than Galileo's concept. Koch, although he's more right than left wing, I think, is, um, is well educated into the standard uh, conventional wisdom 
The conventional wisdom says that Galileo was imprisoned for years for saying the world was round. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Everybody knew the world was round. There wasn't a dispute over that. And furthermore, as we'll discuss in a couple of weeks, he wasn't thrown in prison. Um, there's some dispute as to whether he might have spent one or two days, but we'll get into that controversy. But it certainly wasn't years. House arrest, perhaps, and yes, but just it, it, it's breathtaking that that here's a, a statement that has two major errors in it at once. And Koch obviously believed what he said. And Mazur obviously just moved right along and didn't, didn't object to the historical inaccuracy. And I don't think most people see this as a, um, as a major problem. There is such a thing as a conventional wisdom, and in certain key points, it's wrong. And that's a point that I hope to make later on when we have our discussion about the rakia. Maybe the problem is that Scott is not talking about Darwinism, but evolution. Because you see, Evolution might mean something different from survival of the fittest and so forth. And in fact, I think that's probably true. Eugenie Scott is familiar with multiple definitions of evolution. On the website of the organization that she runs, there is an article called Defining Evolution. Not written by her, but it's written by somebody else, and she obviously approved putting it on. Um, or at least didn't object very strenuously. Um, evolution comes from the Latin unrolling of a scroll, just for what it's worth. It was first used in embryology, as in the evolution of an embryo as it goes from a small egg to multicellular to uh, finally um, a newborn uh, whatever animal it is. Um, which makes it interesting because you've, you've heard of ev uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Ontogeny being, of course, the evolutionary development of the embryo, you see, recapitulates the evolutionary origin of the species. And now you can see why that idea would be so attractive because people were thinking in this, using the same terms. Now before Darwin, when people used this, what they really meant was that organisms were gradually improving, that there was some kind of an evolutionary track that they followed. And so it was like unrolling a scroll, like reading a story, like um, telling a tale. Um, that had a beginning and a middle and an end, uh, that there was a goal towards which evolution was, was going. Um, most of them would say without God. Some would say with God. But this is, this is a different kind of theistic evolution from what we hear about nowadays. This is a theistic evolution, those who believed in God, that gradually allowed this uh, uh, this life to unfold to where there weren't any sudden jumps, but there were gradual movements in a direction that God wanted. That would nowadays, by the way, be called intelligent design because if you can detect that God actually was making that thing move for whatever reason, then that means that, that there was an intelligent designer number one, and number two, that you could detect him. And those are the two key pillars of intelligent design. Uh, Darwin had multiple things that when he 
used the term evolution, which he actually didn't use in The Origin of Species, but he did use in later books. He meant species change, or what he would call descent with modification. That is, you start out with a species, and when you get done, you have a different species because it has moved in a particular direction. Common ancestry, both the limited common ancestry that you would have of two different varieties, and then two different species, and then eventually the whole shebang came from one or a few forms of life. However they happened, whether it was God or a warm little pond. And then natural selection, which is the survival of the fittest, the tooth and claw, the thing that Susan Mazur hates. And biogeography, that is, when an, a species splits into two species, it does so in a localized area, pretty much. It, that, that there's a reason, for example, for why the uh, various marsupials in Australia are all clustered together. And then later on, you see, this is actually a species change without specifying exactly how that happens. So what you would have to say is there were more or less random variations rather than what has become known as the neo-Darwinian th synthesis, which is random mutations and natural selection. These are all definitions of evolution. And then some people would add in genetic drift and uh, what is called canalization, which means that there are only certain pathways in which evolution can take. And to a certain extent, uh, the, that makes sense. If you're going to have flying, then only certain kinds of shapes of wings will work. So if you have a different shape of wings, then you're going to wind up going into flightlessness. You don't have any choice. <coughs> and um, then, uh, uh, thanks to Gould and Eldridge, uh, punctuated equilibrium got added into how fast does evolution happen. Most of the time it doesn't happen at all, and then all of a sudden it'll happen very rapidly in terms of a geologic time. And then some people will even add process structuralism, which process structuralism sounds a lot like self-organization. Now, the official definition of evolution that's being used in, in, the, in the website, uh, the ncsc.com. Um, the word evolution, first it says, it can evoke a variety of meanings, especially for students and members of the general public. For some, evolution is equated with natural selection. Nope. Others think that evolution addresses the origin of life. Nope. Still others impose a distinction between microevolution and macroevolution. Nope. Part of the issue stems from an unclear understanding of what evolution is in a scientific sense. And so here we go. There are three important concepts within evolutionary biology. Number one, the definition of evolution, which is common ancestry and descent with modification, which of course are tied together. That's the definition that Eugenie Scott uses. Now, to be fair, there's one other thing. It's descent with modification that's not done by outside agents. That is, it's not acceptable to say that yes, um, a turtle gave birth to, or, or, or perhaps a crocodile gave birth to a slightly different crocodile whose genes were altered so that it could go that way. And then after that had multiplied, uh, another semi-crocodile went into another, the, say after five particular mutations or something like that, that were planned by somebody and executed by somebody, that by that time we got into from a crocodile to a dinosaur. Um, the definition of evolution also implicitly says nobody monkeyed with the genes. The processes of evolutionary change, for example, natural selection and genetic drift, those are the two processes that they mention. 
The patterns of evolutionary relationships depicted as phylogenetic trees or clad cladograms. The pattern of relationship is not part of the definition. The definition is common ancestry, which of course implies descent with modification, with natural modification, if I can put it that way. The definition, by the way, happens to match that of Dawkins. You know, when Dawkins says, Anybody who doesn't believe in evolution is either ignorant, stupid, insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not think of that. When he was pinned down on what do you mean by evolution in that statement, it's basically common ancestry without divine intervention or without anybody's intervention. So keep in mind that this is the, this is the, the uh, like I say, it's, there is that Bihi who says there's descent, modified descent, but the modifications were done by somebody intelligent. That's not allowed. So that's the definition of evolution that people are saying you've got to accept. Now, the reason for that is very simple. Both Scott and Dawkins are atheists. And if intelligent design were allowed, biology would not be safe for atheists. That is, you can believe in a God that, that uh, set it up this way. You can believe in a God that intervened, but you can never tell. They don't care. But they do care about a God who intervened and you can tell because if that happened, then you can't believe in atheism anymore. Scott, interestingly, doesn't mess with the origin of life. I think she knows that's a losing hand. And so, you know, when she objects, she objects to <coughs> evolution, she objects to global warming, uh, she lets slide the, because um, I think that's a losing hand too, and it also doesn't have anything directly to do with whether there's a God or not. Um, cloning. But she, but she never talks about the origin of life, nor do any of her cohorts in this regard, because they know that if you have to say the evidence for and against, it's a slam dunk, you lose, or they lose. Now, conventional wisdom, I think, is a part of it. Otherwise, global warming wouldn't have gotten into the mix. Uh, that there's a, there is a conventional wisdom that has a creation story and has a salvation story. And the salvation story is, of course, that we've got to stop global warming and we've got to do it by becoming big government types. Um, Mazur quotes uh, Eugenie Scott. The National Center for Science Education Director Eugenie Scott told me that her organization does not support self-organization, which of course is Mazur's big thing, because it is confused with intelligent design, that is, design beyond laws, as Michael Behe, a biochemist at Lehigh University, describes it. Wait a minute. So maybe Self-organization is a reasonable theory, but we won't support it because otherwise people would think about uh, intelligent design. Ooh, I love the intellectual honesty of that uh, position. You see, if children hear that there's a debate about the mechanism, that is, maybe natural selection doesn't have it all sewed up, that maybe there's some problems it hasn't solved, and maybe the other stuff is just too primitive to be able to be, a, uh, you know, self-organization theories are still in their infancy and really can't explain too much yet, that what we're really looking at is some scientists don't believe that random variation and natural selection, which is the only actual mechanism you can sink your teeth into right now, 
are adequate explanations of the life we see around us, they might not buy that evolution understood as descent with modification with nobody monkeying with the modification has a good explanation at all. I suspect that at some level the National Center for Science Education senses this. And that's why Eugenie Scott makes this statement which on the face of it sounds strange. Don't teach the controversy because there is no controversy. Well, there's no controversy within the atheist community or within the theistic community that will go along with a major atheist premise, of course. And anybody else is not, if, you can, if I can put it this way, a true Scotsman. You see, no matter how many PhDs they get, it doesn't matter. What matters is anybody who won't accept a biologic picture that is safe for evolution is just not really a scientist and therefore really doesn't count and therefore there really is no scientific controversy. Therefore, one must avoid the controversy, even the scientific one, so as to allow the kids to be indoctrinated. Because, after all, we're right, so we want them to understand our doctrines. Now, if I can kind of put this out, there are several alternatives one can, one can uh, use for evolution, um, or for the, I don't want to say evolution, I want to say the, um, because evolution has been already taken in a particular way, let's say for the explanation of the biology that we have. One, God did it and we can tell. That's intelligent design. And it doesn't matter whether it is short age creationism, whether it is long age creationism a la Hugh, uh, Hugh Ross, whether it is um, uh, some kind of God's uh, put all the genes in the first place, uh, sort of like Behe has postulated, whether there is a that God that came in and and tweak things now and then, and just you know, monkeyed with the genes, but that's it. But you can tell it's not random. Um, number two is the standard, what is now called theistic evolution. Not the one that has things unfolding, but the one that God set up the process and stood back and saw what was gonna happen. God did it, but then we can't tell which makes no independent predictions and therefore is completely parasitic upon the atheist model. Number three, it happened naturally. Those are your choices. Now, if it happened naturally, let's say for the origin of life, uh, either there is a law or a law with high probability, which means that if you repeat the circumstances, it's gonna happen every single time. Well, that's easy. You can test that. Well, maybe it happens a third of the time or an eighth of the time. You can test that too. And if you do it and it doesn't happen, well, then you say, uh, that theory's been falsified. It's total chance. Now, that's obviously A, not testable, and B, not believable. Nobody believes it's just total chance. And yet, for the origin of life in particular, you're pretty much left with that. And if there is such a thing as irreducible complexity, you're left with that for the origin of the bacterial flagellum. That's the whole point of irreducible complexity, is that you can't get any function until you have 99.9% .9 of the object you're making done. So that, yes, for the last 0.1%, you can get um, you can get uh, uh, a, a, a natural selection to help you because the difference between 5% functioning and 7% functioning might actually get you somewhere. But the problem is the difference between 
0% functioning and 0% functioning, which is where you are at 99.9% .9 of the uh, structure, that's where you can't get. And so from that perspective, evolution itself is in that same boat, although not quite as bad as the origin of life. And the third hypothesis is that it's improbable, but not that improbable. And again, that's a testable one because well, let's supposing there are three places where we had to have dumb luck. And we had to have dumb luck in the order of 10 to the 50th. Well, we're not going to find that kind of stuff in the universe. Okay? But that means that the pathways to them had to be nearly 100% to keep the probabilities below 10 to the 150th. So we should be able to find those pathways that come right up to the big roadblock and then, and then get dumb luck to get us over the one, and then the pathway that goes the rest of the way. Back to the matters, you can't find those pathways, then you're, you know, then you're dealing with something that's falsifiable. And the, fa the final attitude, which is where I think most of them actually are, um, who are really thinking about it. Now, not David Koch, because I think David Koch's been indoctrinated. And it's obvious what kinds of things he's been indoctrinated with. But for the, the scientists who really understand that there is a controversy, but don't want to say so, the reason why is because it's science regardless of the evidence. And at that point, you're dealing with a religion. And there's no way you can uh, maneuver from there. And uh, the, the classic statement of this is Lewontin. I'm butchering that name, I think. Lewontin. Um, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. Notice that he's deliberately putting science and the supernatural at odds with each other. The definition of science is that it doesn't have the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of, and those are his italics, by the way, the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. It's not intellectually coherent completely, but we're believing it anyway, and why? Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. Notice he's explicitly denying this idea, well, I'm just an evolutionist because of the evidence. But on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence, I'm sorry, that should have been italicized too, I don't know how I missed that, to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. So the initiated know that we've got to get God out of this. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You can't have evolution, but God made, because once you admit that God made uh, the first forms of life, uh, the game's over. So what we're dealing with really is not science in the sense that most of us think of science. You know, hypothesis generating, testing, seeing whether it works, uh, building on the theory, then testing it in other circumstances, see how far it works, all that stuff. What we're really dealing with is science as a definitional opposition to the supernatural that we start out knowing the supernatural isn't so. And now they, of course, would call the, they would say this is not theology. It's, um, but it is a theology. It is the denial that there's anything out there that we need to uh, uh, study or can study or even can reveal itself. And I, I think that understanding that that's where, it where it's coming from 
will help you to understand why Eugenie Scott says, what controversy? There is no controversy. Because you see, if you're inside of that group, well, yeah, there's controversy in how evolution works, but there's not a controversy over whether evolution happened. That is to say, descent with modification and everything coming from life, which eventually itself had to come from non-living material without any divine intervention. Because the rules say we can't have divine intervention. Uh, it'd be an interesting question to ask why the rules say that. With that, I will uh, allow uh, and welcome comments. I'll just make one comment about next week's meeting. Uh, Tom Zaltvall from the Netherlands will be here. Uh, for those of you who came in late, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, he'll be talking about the uh, question of the evolution of man. Uh, and we'll give some details about old, his research in Old Divide Gorge. Uh, he's been a um, fervent supporter of creation, however, he does it in a critical scientific context, as we all should do. So, um, interesting, he's, he's had uh, television controversies and so on, and it promises to be an interesting report of what is going on there in that country. Uh, as far as the lecture here, I, ju I just reminiscing a little bit about this, uh, which is, um, you know, in the Scopes trial, uh, the question of academic freedom was very important. Why couldn't the uh, state of Tennessee allow people to uh, think beyond the Bible? Uh, the picture is completely reversed in a ways, and yet it's exactly the same in another ways, and that is right now in this, this uh, new law and so on. Hey, uh, gotta allow some thinking beyond the dogma, the accepted dogma of evolution, and the very, very principle of um, academic freedom is being applied in just the opposite to get the opposite results, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's a good principle. You, uh, truth can afford to be fair. Alan White tells us truth can afford to be fair, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, we need to always keep that in mind. As far as saying that there is no controversy, simply, to me, it just simply is, is kind of an elitist statement, isn't it? If you're thinking that, if you're talking about um, being in a group, and you look within the group and there's no controversy, you're excluding another group from that. Well, that's... That's precisely the, the, the point. And, and really, this is the no true Scotsman uh, uh, fallacy, you know, that, um, that what happens is that anybody who disagrees with you, well, they just don't count. And if one of your long term buddies that's in the group now disagrees with you, they don't count either. Um, and it, it's the perfect way to keep yourself from ever having to answer the question. So like with global warming, if somebody came up with some evidence going against global warming as far as being man-made, um, and then they push it off as being outside of the group, <clears throat> um, is that science? That depends on how you define science. If science is what scientists do, then it's science, because scientists do that, at least some scientists. If, if science is actually supposed to be an objective process which is supposed to lead us closer to truth, then it's obviously not science. <laughs> yes. And... Um, I have a question uh, related to the Tennessee and Louisiana law. 
I was uh, reading an article in Spanish authored by Harold Weiss. I don't know if you know him. Harold Weiss? Harold Weiss. He used to teach uh, at Andrews University. And he and also used to teach at Notre Dame, I think. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. He spells he it with an E. H-E-R-O-L-D. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I know him from uh, Argentina. And uh, we canvassed, uh, did culpator work in the south of uh, Ar Argentina. Uh, my, uh, his argument, he has a very, how do you say, critical view of the position of the Michigan uh, conference regarding La Sierra University. He says, this, this is ridiculous. Uh, they are trying to force uh, teachers, science teachers at La Sierra University to teach creation instead of evolution. They want to deprive our young people from a knowledge of the theory of evolution, which is so well accepted by the, by the rest of the world. So, my question is, is he right? <laughs> because I see in what the, uh, th these laws in Louisiana and Tennessee more agreeable with your position, with Sean's position, and with uh, the educate tr truth position, which who are asking for fairness in the right to present the evidence, not religious, but at least scientific evidence in favor and against the theory evolution. What is your reaction to what Harold? Um, well, I think, I think Weiss has a point. Um, I can understand the Michigan Conference saying that La Sierra University is not sufficiently Adventist that we're going to subsidize people going there. They want to go there, fine, but not with our money. That I can understand. I think it's a little harder to say, you know what, anybody who is from La Sierra University, regardless of whether they're the you know, music people, the band, the, uh, the academy, whatever, that, that you know, you're just going to have to cancel all appointments and all contacts. I think that's probably going a little overboard there. I agree with you on that, but he did not spend most of the time in his article about what you're saying. He rather criticized and argued that what the, some elements in the church want is that creationism, creationism be taught a science in La Sierra University and that our young people be deprived of a knowledge of the theory of evolution. And I don't see, I haven't seen that demand from uh, uh, Educate Truth. I, I think that Harold Weiss is either, I, I hope it's unintelligently repeating a talking point or else he's, he's repeating a talking point knowing that it's false. Because uh, neither I nor Sean Pittman or uh, uh, Shane Hilde nor any of those people that I know of have argued that we should not be teaching the theory of evolution as a theory. Uh, in fact, I think most of us would say that we would rather have it taught more accurately so that people can understand what it is because they're going to have to deal with it if they go to graduate school or whatever or if they're at the lunch counter with their fellow doctors after they've gone to Loma Linda Medical School and never touched the subject and then all of a sudden they're thrown into the rest of the world and they have no clue as to what's going on. We don't want that. The point that we're trying to make is not that it shouldn't be taught. It's that it shouldn't be taught as the norm. 
And, and somehow, uh, some of these people, I think unwittingly, are, making, are mixing those two up. Some of them, I know good and well, have been ex had that point explained to them again and again. And they're deliberately not listening because, uh, I don't know, it fits their agenda or something. Um, I, I, because I've, I've talked to people at length on this sometimes and then had them turn around and use the same old argument right after we had just knocked it down. You know, it's one thing for them to say that this is the way things are. It's another thing for them to say, this is our belief. You know, our belief is what we say it is and, and you know, other than that you're ta calling us liars. Uh, it's just like I don't feel like I have the ability, you know, I, I take and try to quote Eugenie Scott directly. I try to, I didn't show it to you here, but I try to read around those quotes to make sure that the, the thought that she's expressing is the thought that I'm trying to, that I'm pulling out of it and that I'm not taking her out of context. Because I don't think it's fair for us to take these people and read a little quote here and read a little quote there that happens to fit our particular propagandistic message and then, uh, and then uh, ignore the fact that that's not what she's saying at all. That's why one of the things that I was trying to do here is to help people understand when these people say evolution, here is what they actually mean because you know, you can find it on their website. And it doesn't mean what most of us think. It, it, they are not slavish Darwinians. Well, some of them think Darwinism is the only game in town, so then they're stuck with it. But the logic doesn't go from, uh, from Darwinism proper. It actually goes from evolution must be true, Darwinism is the only good explanation of evolution, therefore Darwinism must be true, therefore if you speak against Darwinism, you're in trouble, see? And um, in her case, I think there's, there's clearly an element of, but if we don't tell them about uh, Darwinism and act like it's true, then what kind of convincing can we do? And see, to me, that's salesmanship. But I think I'm being fair to her. You know, it's just that we happen to disagree on some fundamentals, that's all. What, uh, excuse me for adding something else, what shocked me is the fact that Harold and myself went through the same educational system and we were taught the theory of evolution uh, right in our schools in Argentina 50 or 60 years ago. And then he comes up with this theory that now we want to deprive our youth from the knowledge of the theory of evolution. He knows very well that he was educated, he was taught the theory of evolution in high school, in college. So well, you see, the one part that you're depriving people of is the fact that evolution happens to be true. <laughs> my experience, and I've been on the board of the uni one of the universities for 10 years and my experience going through the system, what di disappoints me significantly in a lot of our faculty science teachers and that I don't know whether it's the Balbreet, they were browbeat in the 70s to have to kowtow to evolution and so they, they dance and say they have faith but they don't do their homework like what we're talking about doing here and have a thorough understanding of the controversy and are willing to teach that controversy clearly to our students so they can defend themselves. What I have gotten with my own children going through is that, yeah, evolution is actually the underlying truth is evolution's true, but I have faith anyway. And it's a, extremely disappointing to me that the individuals who should be at the peak of the understanding of the controversy and the ability to teach it to my students and my own children when they go to one our university so they can face that controversy accurately is not has not been done and they seem to be rather shallow in their approach to this which really disappoints me and the second thing is I don't understand how we have so many Christians that do not understand that if you have death and dying before the fall 
You do not have Christianity because you don't have a fall and you don't need a redeemer and you therefore don't need a Christ. They just totally blow that off and somehow they dance around evolution and we got to have all these years of death and dying and you can't do it and walk in and say you're a Christian because you have no reason for a redeemer and you have no Christ Christology. Christology, no, no reason for it. So I don't understand how you can do those two. It's actually even slightly worse than that. Because if you follow the methodology that got you to the point that said there was death before the fall, then how do you reject the idea that there really wasn't an Adam and Eve, there's really like 10,000 humanoids that gradually became more human? Or as their descendants gradually became more human? And that the whole, the whole Adam and Eve story is gone. Not just not just the idea that there is death, because you can always say, well, that was just animal death. Uh, Hugh Ross tries to do that. But these guys don't like Hugh Ross either. These guys are dead set against any divine intervention whatsoever. You know, and my, uh, my view is almost that if you're going to get, uh, you know, in jail for s stealing a lamb, you might as well steal a sheep. But if you're going to take a paycheck, from an institution that represents a certain value system and you fail to support that value system, then you should take a paycheck from a different company so that those that are paying for that product are getting what they think they're paying for. It's not that you don't have the freedom to believe whatever you want to believe, but you don't work for Disney and say they're a trash company. Um. I can't argue with the logic of that. Uh, it's, I, think, I think there's a problem. Well, I, I was just going to emphasize the same point. Uh, the difference between the Michigan Conference and La Sierra is that the Michigan Conference tells its believers what they believe and they stand by it and so on. La Sierra claims they're an Adventist institution and they have in the past uh, been destroying the faith in the Bible and the students in their biology classes. And uh, by the way, not just in the biology classroom. This is actually a. Uh, been, this is where <laughs> it where it runs into the 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 most obvious problems. But there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on that are not just not just uh, biology, but. I Biology is just the point man right now. It's the canary in the ca in, in the uh, in the cave. cave. Yeah, I, I just uh, might add. I, I'm hoping that uh, this is being redeemed a little bit. I think uh, the, uh, there's realization that there's a problem here, and uh, there are indications that uh, at least there's some encouragement, some movement in the right direction there at La Sierra. The, the one thing, th the thing I see is that I am glad to see this controversy out in the open because I think that it needs to be, I don't think this needs to be something that where people talk over here and people talk over here. I think that it needs to be a, a, a flat out meeting to where people get to see what the real issues are. That's one reason why even though I think uh, my own performance could have been improved, uh, I was glad to have uh, Brian Bolin, Fritz Guy, here a few weeks ago um, because I think that just simply allowing people to see what's going on will make a difference. Uh, hopefully, we'll make more of a difference as we delve into what the Bible actually says and whether they can sustain the points they made about the, uh, there being no excuse for calling, um, translating the Rakia as expanse. I think we're going to see some evidence that maybe there's a little better evidence than what they, what they saw. Um, I don't believe it's, God it's is afraid of, of being tested. Yeah. And I don't think our faith should ever be afraid of being tested. I don't, to, to fail to do so would be disingenuous to our young people and to ourselves. God's not afraid to be tested. Yeah. Um, in, you know, for all the uh, don't tempt the Lord thy God, there's also the passage in Malachi where he says, and you, you know, bring in the tithes and 
see what happens. And I think, I think that there is a certain point where God actually invites us to, to look at things. Well, I think the whole great controversy is really a test of God versus evil. And uh, he in, engineered that whole controversy, more or less, to show and so that we would learn and perhaps the universe would learn that uh, selfishness just doesn't work. I couldn't agree more. A quick question, Paul. Have you kept up or seen anything? How has the, the Catholic Church been dealing with the, the issue of ed education in, in their institutions? Because you see so much publicly, I, I mean, I know that the church itself's positions, you know, had some acceptance of, of evolution, but they take such strong positions on, on other things like, you know, abortion, but you don't hear the same public stuff on, on evolution, and, the, and what do they teach, and how, how has that worked in their institutions? The Catholic Church is scared to death of Galileo. And... Uh, I, I, we as Adventists have very little understanding of why that is. It's not really because you couldn't get the Bible to, to, to fit Galileo. It's because the Catholic Church stood up and in official pronouncements that involved the Pope himself said, Galileo's books are not to be read. They contain falsehoods. And the falsehoods that they contain specifically are not that the Pope is an idiot, which is why Galileo got in trouble to begin with. Um, they are that the, the, the earth moves. And so if people push really hard, uh, one of the few things that, uh, well, one of, the, one of the things that Andrew Dixon White brought out is this particular controversy and the impact it had on the idea of papal infallibility. That's what's really at stake for them. You see, at, at that point, they're going to have to do what... Uh, Harold Weiss, was, uh, what many people are telling us to do, which is to say, well, the evidence is all that way, but I believe it anyway, see. Um, the, the fact of the matter is they're having to tell their faithful to believe against the evidence. And the more that Galileo is brought up, uh, the more, the more uh, desperate explaining they have to do as to how the church wasn't actually wrong. And in fact, one of the ways that, that one of the ways that they finally, um, at least for Andrew Dixon White, and he documents this, uh, that they finally came up with it, was to say, well, the church was wrong, but really, God wanted the church to be wrong so it would stay out of science. It's really uh, all come down to authority. It comes down to authority. Galileo is, is, if you can put it that way, is kryptonite to them. And that's why Galileo is such a big deal. And that's why the church has basically rolled over. You can have all the evolution you want, just give us a human soul. Because they know that without that they're hung. Um, and uh, they're even willing to treat the whole Garden of Eden story and the fall of man as a metaphorical thing as long as you give them a soul and you allow there to have been some kind of a vaguely defined fall. But then how does that whole thing not bleed over into the other positions on abortions and contraceptions and everything else? Because they're able to make a sharp distinction between facts and values. 
which I will have to say I am not. Yeah. It, it does seem to me that the value of treating a human life depends partly on whether you can resuscitate brain function or not. And that if a person's total brain is gone, they're brain dead, they're dead, at that point uh, you're allowed to do things like take heart out for a transplant because there's nobody upstairs anyway. Um, but if the fact of the matter is that there is somebody upstairs, perhaps mostly gone, but there's, you know, there's, there's some cognitive ability there, then you can't take out the heart. And what that means is that the facts bleed into values. And so I, I, I can't do the thing that they do, which is to say that it doesn't matter for abortion um, because it's you know, kind of a faith-based thing. I have to say, um, no, it's also fact as well as faith-based. Just for one thing, if the lady is not pregnant, it doesn't matter. You know, and, and of course, they would say, well, of course, if the lady is pregnant, it doesn't, how do you know the lady is pregnant? See? And, and that's where it, I see them being able to isolate abortion from the rest of the group uh, that way, and them being able to isolate a few other contraception in particular from the rest of the, because, because you see it's, it's faith-based, it's values-based, it's not, um, it, it's, it's not fact-based. They've given up the facts. After Galileo, they've thrown in the towel on facts. So in the schools, they're basically teaching the whole evolution thing and then just saying, but we don't believe that for faith well, reasons. No, they don't even say that. They say evolution is how God did it. Okay. And uh, in fact, um, uh, Kenneth Miller makes a very good point as to how he was taught evolution in Catholic schools. Yes. Yeah. Um, your comments reminded me of an article I was reading this week about transplantation. This father, his uh, young son was in an accident. So they took him to the hospital. They put him on induced coma. And uh, they have the, the reasons. They don't say why they do it, but uh, there is a, a, a reason, hidden reason for doing this. Because they want to make sure all the organs are in good condition. Yes. Because then they, what they do is they declare the person brain dead and then they can use the organs for transplantation. Now, the father said, no way. I want a second opinion from a neurologist outside of this medical institution and a physician outside of this medical institution. And they came in, ran some tests, and they said, we detect a little bit of brain activity. Well, what happened is that the young man eventually, well, they recovered. They took him out of a coma state. And after a few weeks, he was let go. He went, to, he went home, and now he's studying at the university. Now, this hit me very hard. You know why? Because of a personal experience. You know that 16 years ago, we lost our daughter to a car accident. Well, she died immediately. But a year ago, my son, 51, was taken to the hospital and he was put on induced coma. 
he was given propofol. And when I heard the word propofol, it reminded me of Jackson. Yes. Michael Jackson. Yes. And I said, what, why are they giving propofol? Well, then I didn't, I wish I knew all this. I mean, the knowledge I got from this article, but I was totally ignorant. And a physician came after four days, he did some tests, he says he's brain dead, there's no way he can recover. And Would we you like to donate his organs? Yeah. Of course and we... And it's a wonderful thing to do, and if they're really telling the truth, I would have to applaud them. Yeah. So my daughter-in-law said, what do you think? And she asked other people. The pastor says, well, I mean, you, uh, some good can come out, out of this. And uh, they asked me, I said, I'm ambivalent. I, I had no knowledge. And uh, of course, the organs were donated. But I'm still wondering, maybe today I could have my son. Now, now regarding... I'm going to say something. You did the best you could with the knowledge you had. Yeah. Okay? I, I don't think... I, I don't think God judges that very harshly at all. Um, in fact, I think, that, uh, I think that given the information you had, you did the right thing. I do agree that it makes a huge difference whether brain function is recoverable or not. And I do agree that if you put somebody in into an induced coma, you can't tell, and it is not fair. It is if I can put it that way, it's bad medical practice. Now, can I add something? Um, it is uh, you, to, to, to make somebody to where they have no brain waves and then to test them for brain waves. And of course, they don't have any brain waves because you just squashed them all. But that doesn't mean they can't come back. And so the only way to do this fairly is to take them out of a coma and they don't come out and you do the brain waves. And in fact, I'm conservative enough to say, you know, I'd like to see somebody do, to see whether there's any blood flow up there. Because if there is, then I'm not quite as sure that it's really brain dead, you know. If there's no brain activity and no blood flow, I'm willing to say, I mean, wh where do you go from there? Okay, but what, what I, the point I'm making is a very critical one that's true regardless of who's right and who's wrong on these kinds of decisions. It makes a huge difference what the physical facts are, what the moral thing to do is. You cannot separate facts from values completely. You can't do it. And anybody who tells you you can just hasn't thought it through very far. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, if I had known what I know today, I would have suggested a second opinion from the neurologist. But it's too late now. It's done. What can I, can I do? There's nothing I can do. But All you uh, can do is say you did the best you can in the circumstances yeah. with the knowledge you had and, and let it go with that and ask God to forgive if you did something wrong. Yeah. That's all you can do. But uh, I wanted to add something else because uh, both of you mentioned abortion in the Catholic Church. I made a video uh, dealing with the origin of life. When does human life begin? I have the Catholic position, the Southern Baptist position, the Adventist position, including the thinking of uh, Sean Pittman, uh, Jerome Winslow, Neil Will, uh, Wilson, and many others. It lasts 15 minutes. And if you are at the point where you, you're wondering if, uh, if this uh, would be interesting to be presented here, I'm willing to do that. I sent this video to Japan. <laughs> and a gentleman named Daniel Winters, he put it, uh, how do you say, he narrated it. So it's professionally done, 
I believe. And uh, if you are interested, I can, I can, uh, I'm willing to present it to yeah. this class if, if you think this is a topic, because it deals with the origin of life. Well, actually, one of the things that I have been interested in the last few weeks, and eventually I'm going to bring it to the class, and, and your video may be a good introduction, uh, depending on, uh, f I, I want to be careful about the Adventist position, because I think there are several Adventist positions, and um, I don't think they're all right. Uh, well, for one thing, they're contradictory, so they can't all be right. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, but one of the interesting things that's happened recently uh, is that the governor of Mississippi passed a law which will probably end abortion in the state of Mississippi. And how they did that is very simple. Uh, they required all abortionists to have privileges at a hospital so if th something goes wrong in the abortion clinic, they can take care of it. Well, guess what? Most of these people are, mm, to be kind, we'll say fly by night. And uh, there isn't a qualified abortionist. And one of the things that was happening in Mississippi, because it was hard to get abortions, was that they were getting people to fly in from out of state and do a bunch of them and then fly back. Well, of course, those people are having their abortions and they're dumped on the system. I, as emergency physician, have witnessed this happen in California where, of course, there shouldn't be any barriers in theory. Uh, to where, you know, I, I have somebody who's, let's say, an ear, nose, and throat person whose uh, tonsillectomy goes bad and they're bleeding. I call them up and either they or somebody else is on the phone and they say, do this, and so I do it. I, you know, orthopedist who had his hip surgery, I call him and what about this red streak, you know, what do you want me to do about it? There's somebody on call for them. You know, um, they sense, they know that we're actually their friends. We're trying to help them out in a situation that, that could go bad on them, uh, that's starting to go bad and, and hopefully, you know, we can work as a team together and get this thing taken care of. Um, we're, uh, we're in a sense saving them from at least a lawsuit, if not a lost lawsuit. Um, so th most of them are really helpful. The people that I have never had be helpful ever is people who have done abortions. There's no phone number to call. You can't find out what they actually did what they found, how big the baby was that they took out, uh, excuse me, fetus. Um, <laughs> um, you can't find anything like that out. Uh, you know, I think Hippocrates had it right. Physicians shouldn't do abortions because what it does is it transforms medicine from the helping profession to the death dealing profession. Now that's a, I realize a politically charged statement, but just my experience with those people is that the SCUS doesn't stop at doing the abortions itself. And so what happened in minute, minute, Mississippi is, they just required them to be decent doctors that could take care of their own patients if something went wrong. All of a sudden, there's nobody that can do it. Interesting. And, and by the way, the law, as far as I know, is perfectly constitutional because you can require anything of anybody who's doing medical procedures, and abortion is a medical procedure. I mean, anything reasonable. And it does seem reasonable that you take care of your own. But they're not prepared to. Just a little interesting thing. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll, th we'll throw that in as uh, put a little meat on it. And, and uh, 
then uh, have a discussion. Anyway, uh, next week, Tom uh, Zitavella, or however they pronounce his name, will be here, and I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs>